Would you please turn with me to 1 John chapter 4? First John chapter 4, I'm picking up the series from verse 7 of chapter 4. Let us hear God's word read. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your word, we ask for your blessing upon it preached, and we pray, God, would you give us hearts that are ready to listen to you and to trust in you and to see Jesus, our salvation. We pray this in his wonderful name. Amen. What makes the world go round? Money. Almost. Love makes the world go round. Well, so the old song lyric goes. It's an old lyric that dates back to the 1800s. Love makes the world go round. And by the looks of things, it certainly does. Unfortunately, in many cases, it makes the world go round and round and round in circles. And it also makes many people go round the bend. In case you don't know what that means, it means going insane. Well, friends, things should be very different in the church of Jesus Christ. We should be able to show the world what pure love looks like, what true love looks like. Uh, love should make the church go round God. And that's what the Apostle John is telling us about in this passage. He wants us as a church to orbit around God's love. And I want to show you three very important things about love in this passage. Three things. The first is the standard of love. The second is the showcase of love. And thirdly, the should of love. Let's start with the standard of love, verse 7. Have a look at it with me. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now, it's one thing to say God loves. And it's a whole different thing to say God is love. It's like when you listen to one piece of music and you come away from it saying, that was a good piece of music. And it's a whole other thing to listen to another song and say, now that is music. What are you saying about the second song? Well, you're saying that should be the standard. Okay. If other music is to be any good, it needs to be like that piece of music. Well, that's kind of what John is saying about God. God is not just one of the great lovers. He is the lover. John goes even further than that. He says God is the very essence of love. Uh, God is love. And love is from God. Without God, there is no such thing as love here on planet Earth. Let me put it to you practically. God is the reason why people make friends. 
and why people get married and why people have children and love their children and what and God is the reason ultimately why grannies and grandpas love their grandchildren it's stamped into our being because we're made in the image of God love is from God so wherever you see true love you see a reflection of who God is all true love is from God and I know that there are many perversions of love, aren't there? I mean, we see this all over the world. We see it all over the LGBTQI plus movement. And in many other perversions in the world, but what I'm saying is this, true love, whatever shape, size, or form, true love is an echo of God's original love. Now, here's an amazing thing to think about. The fact that God is love is rooted in the fact that God is Trinity. We believe that God exists in three eternal persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and these three are one being. These three persons have always loved each other. Love is an eternal reality because they have always loved each other. The Bible tells us that they are constantly giving one another to each other, serving one another, rejoicing in one another, glorifying one another, praising one another. In short, they've always been loving one another. God is Love. Love is a description of the way these three persons have always been happy in one another's presence. And words really fail to describe the intensity and the beauty of that eternal love. The Reformed uh, theologian Cornelius Plantinga tried to put words to it when he said this, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit glorify each other at the center of the universe self-giving love is the dynamic currency of the trinitarian life of god the persons within god exalt commune with and defer to one another each divine person harbors the others at the center of his being in constant movement of overture and acceptance each person envelops and encircles the other in other words, there has always been this pure, joyful, selfless, self-giving love in the Trinity. And it is out of that original love that God made the world. And he made us to know that love and to experience it and to join in with it. Now, I wonder if this is what you really believe about God tonight. I know some of you are carrying serious burdens with you. You're anxious about things. Some of you have been through some really tough things this week. And you are told in your Bible, and you are reminded by your pastors, that God is sovereign. God is in control. This God of love, which means that whatever you are going through right now is part of his plan for your life. Now, let's say you, you believe this. You claim to understand that this God of love is in control, but do you really think that he is love? Do you really think that the things he sent your way this week are an expression of eternal love? perfect love for you that's a whole different story isn't it and here's the problem you know if we divorce God's control from his love then we'll feel like God isn't love he's quite cruel and you've heard the the unbelievers object if God were so loving why would he allow this why would he allow that and sometimes we we don't agree with that intellectually but the, the pangs in our heart almost do. 
Now, here's the thing. John, the apostle, is reminding us that this God is love. That's a fact. Doesn't matter what your feelings are telling you. Here is the fact. But how do we know that he really is love? How do we know that for sure? How does God prove that to us without a shadow of a doubt? Well, this brings us to the next main point. The showcase of love. Listen to where John goes. Verse 9, he says, In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Okay, so how do we know God is really loving toward us? Well, here are two amazing reasons. The first is God sent his son into the world to give sinners life. And the second reason is God took the initiative to love these people while they hated him. Let's start with the first part. God sent his son into the world to give sinners life. What John says here in verse nine is almost a copy and paste of John 3.16. It's the most famous Bible verse in the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Why is that such good news? Well, friends, it's simply because we deserve the exact opposite. What we deserve is God sending his son to bring us death. That's what we deserve. We've all sinned against this holy God, and we don't deserve to live. That's a hard pull for many of us to swallow. And it's something that I suspect many evangelicals don't really believe. Let me try and illustrate it to you like this. None of us have been on death row, have we? So no dark secrets here. None of you have been on death row. What on earth is death row? We've forgotten about that in South Africa. It means you're awaiting awaiting execution. Nikki and I recently watched a striking movie called Just Mercy, Just Mercy. It's based on the true story of Brian Stevenson, who was a Harvard graduate lawyer who decided to defend poor prisoners who were on death row in rural Alabama. Brian's most famous case was that of Walter McMillan in the 90s. Brian proved that the case that was made against Walter was false, even though he was already on death row. And Brian eventually managed to persuade the Supreme Court of the United States to overturn the ruling of the court in Alabama. Walter was released from prison after six years on death row. If Brian did not intervene, he would have been wrongly executed by electric chair. So then I started thinking about myself. I thought about myself before the Supreme Court of the universe, whose judge is God Almighty. No lawyer is able to get me off the hook by proving my innocence because I'm not innocent. And I realized I deserve something far worse than the electric chair, as horrific as that might sound. Can you even imagine what it's like to be on death row in this world? You and I really don't understand. Now, how much less do we really understand what it means to be on God's death row? We don't. In many ways, we say we do, but we don't realize the gravity of that problem. But God wants us to understand it. Now, friends, it should be 
absolutely amazing news that God, the supreme court judge of the universe, would send his son into the world to bring criminals to life. And how does he do so? Well, look at verse 10. He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, I hope you remember my explanation of propitiation from my sermon on the 7th of August, 2022. If you haven't, I forgive you. If you didn't hear it, propitiation means to appease someone who is angry. It's to make a sacrifice in order to appease them, to pacify them, to bring peace. Okay, let me illustrate it like this. Imagine you're not paying attention, you're driving, and you drive into the back of a brand new Mercedes Benz. You get out of the car and the owner of the Benz is fuming. Uh, he, he looks like a volcano that's about to erupt. Now imagine you say to the Benz owner, I'm so sorry, it was all my fault. Here's what I'm gonna do to make it up to you. I'm gonna arrange for the finest panel beater in East London to fix it up for you. I'm gonna pay for it, and in the meantime, I'm going to arrange an even better Mercedes for you to drive around in. And on top of that, I'm gonna make sure that you and your family enjoy a wonderful meal at the restaurant of your choosing. How do you think the Merck driver is gonna feel? Well, he might say, well, I hope we bump into each other again. That is a form of propitiation. Okay, sacrifices have made, gifts are offered to pacify the offended party. Now, here's the important difference between that story and the Christian faith. In the Christian faith, we've offended God, but there is nothing we can bring to appease him. No amount of good works, no amount of repentance, no amount of tears, no amount of sacrifice that we could bring could possibly make it up. But God is love. So what does love do? God sends his son to propitiate. God provides his own propitiation. His son. And his son takes the punishment. His son takes the electric chair, so to speak, for us. So that we would receive eternal life instead of death. That is the gospel. And that's what's so astonishing about this love. Now here's something even more amazing about it. Here's the added layer. The second point that John makes is this. God showed this kind of love to people who hated him. Look at verse 10. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God didn't send his son because we showed so much love to him. No, we, we were his enemies, the Bible says, when he planned all of this. He had to initiate all of it. Imagine a Ukrainian father who loses his son in battle. Now imagine how hard it would be for this father to find the Russian soldiers who killed his son and then to take the initiative, go to them, and embrace them and welcome them into his home and give them food and a safe place to stay. Now that would be unthinkable generosity and initiative, at least from our perspective. Well, that's kind of what God did, but on a much, much bigger scale. God loved rebel soldiers who killed his son and God welcomes them into his home and calls them his sons. So when we get to heaven one day and someone asks us, how, do you get, how did you get here? If you understand the gospel, you would have to say, well, God loved me here. I didn't love him. He loved me here. Now let's circle back to the question that I asked earlier. Is God really love? 
After the week that you've, uh, you've just been through, uh, you might be secretly questioning his love. You might be thinking, if God is really so loving, why did he allow this? Why did he allow that? Why did he allow this to my career? Why did he allow that to my health or my friend's health or my mom's health? Um, why, does, why does he allow the things he does to our country? Is he really loving it? Now, here's the thing, friends. It's, it's one thing to question a God that we feel is high and removed and distant from reality. It's one thing to look up to what we think is this ivory tower of heaven and to try and imagine that God loves us down from, up from there. But it's a whole other thing to question the God who sent his son into the mess, who took the blame and punishment for our sin. That's a whole other story. I've been listening to a wonderful new song by Matt Redman on repeat, and he tries to capture this. He says, some imagined you are distant and removed, but you chased us down in merciful pursuit. To the sinner you were grace and the broken you embraced, and in the end the proof is in your wound. Blood and tears. How can it be? There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the son of suffering. That's how we know God is love. Now, as I said in the beginning of the sermon, this this is the love that should make the church go round. We need to get into orbit around this God who loves like this. Now, what would that look like in the, in the life of a local church, practically? What does it look like in a group of people who claim to know and love this God of love? This brings us to the final main point. The should of love. Look at verse 11 with me. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought, also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God's, sorry, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Do you see the should of love? If God so loved us, surely we should love one another. Now let's get the order correct. We don't need to love one another so that God will love us. Just as Pastor Mark reminded us this morning, we don't read the Bible faithfully so that God would like us more. We don't love each other so that God would love us. That's anti-gospel. That's legalism. No, we should love one another because God has loved us. That's the gospel. Now, here's why it's so important to get the order right when it comes to loving one another. Let me put it like this. If I love you because I want God to love me more and bless me more, then I'm using you then I'm using you. That's not love. That's selfishness. Okay, let me put it in an illustration. Imagine you say to your son, if you're not nice to your sister, you're not going to get ice cream for dessert. Now, if your son really, really loves ice cream, he'll be as nice as necessary to his sister. And he will bite his tongue tolerate his sister's rough edges so that he can get ice cream. It's self-centered. He doesn't really love his sister for her own good or for her own sake. And when, he, he, when the game is over, when he's had his ice cream, guess what happens? No more obligation. Now, that's not how God wants us to love each other. So what's the alternative? 
Well, God wants us to be so radically moved by his gospel love that we love each other, not because we have to or because there's something in it for us. We love each other for God's glory and for each other's good. Selflessly. Now, there's a a story told about the creation of Adam and Eve and the beginning of their love relationship. You know, Adam asks God, why did you make Eve so beautiful? And God replied, so that you would love her. And then Adam asked, but why did you make her so dumb? God answered, so she would love you. Jokes aside, friends, God doesn't want us to love like that either. Okay, we shouldn't love each other just because of one another's beauty. You shouldn't just find the people that are lovable. That's not how love in the church works. Nor should we love each other out of a sense of stupidity or naivety or gullibility. Okay, there will be many times when we are not beautiful enough to be loved and when we will be smart enough to understand each other's deep flaws. And it's in those moments that we need a love far more powerful than the love that we're used to giving. We need to tap into gospel love, loving selflessly, loving to the glory of God. And when we Learn to love like that, we bring God most glory. Okay, when we love like that, we're in a sense saying to God, God, your love is the best. Your love is the most beautiful love, and we want to love like you. And so it gives glory to God, and it is so, so good for his people. Now let's get practical here as we come to the end of the sermon. I've spoken a lot about motives in love, but now let's get down to earth and practical. How do we love like this? Let's talk about an example. Well, John has just given us an amazing example. God sent his son into the world to make propitiation for our sins. In other words, Jesus absorbed the wrath of God so that we would be spared. And John says to us, this is love, and now you should love. Given enough time in the church, you will get irritated and offended by people. Someone is going to do something wrong to you, or they're going to fail to do something right for you, and it's going to hurt and you're going to be offended. Someone is going to provoke your wrath. Maybe there are examples flooding your mind right now. And just by the way, while you think of others, you do things that get on people's nerves too. They are not the only ones with flaws. Now, there's a a story about a Baptist who gets stranded on a desert island, and eventually when the rescuers find him, they notice that there are three huts on the island. So they ask him, what are these for? And he says, well, the one is my home, and uh, the one next to that is my church. And they ask, what about the third one? And he says, that's the church I used to go to. We will get irritated. And sometimes we become completely irrational about it. And here's the problem. We often deal with that wrath and that anger and that frustration in ways that are destructive and unloving. Here are a few examples. We give people the cold shoulder. We ignore them. We try to avoid them. Now, you see that person coming to you from the other side of the parking lot, and you look for an escape route. That's one way that we fail to deal with anger in, in a right way. 
Here's another way. We vent about someone's bad behavior behind their backs. We crucify them behind their backs. And of course, they don't stand a chance to defend themselves because you've taken it upon yourself to be the judge, jury, and executioner, and they don't even know they're on trial. And here's another way. You might blow up. You might attack them in a heated personal confrontation. You might pull them to pieces, so to speak. Pull them over the coals, insult them, break down their character in an unfair way. These are some of the terrible ways in which we deal with our own wrath. So what is the loving way to deal with hurt? Well, we need to reenact the gospel. We need to live out this gospel of God. What did God do when we offended him? Well, the first thing he did is he, he told, us, told us about it, didn't he? Uh, he approached us and he spoke to us. He told us what we did wrong, truthfully. He didn't twist it, he didn't misrepresent it, he didn't lie about us. He told the truth and he told us how it made him feel. He, he expressed the pain that he has in being part of this broken relationship. The second thing he does is he offers full forgiveness. In other words, he doesn't just tell us that we messed up to humiliate us, to break us down and to just throw us away. No, he tells us because he wants reconciliation. He wants the relationship to be healed. He wants the sweetness of the relationship to be restored. And so he generously and graciously offers us forgiveness. But then he also absorbs his own wrath. He propitiates himself. Instead of pouring his anger out on us, he takes the cost. He takes the hit so that we don't have to. Okay, so how do we apply it to our conflict? Well, the Bible says, first, talk to the person who offended you and tell them the truth. Don't distort. Don't gaslight. Don't manipulate. Don't exaggerate. Don't lie. Talk truthfully to the person that hurt you, that offended you. Tell them how it made you feel. And of course, don't do it in such a way that makes them feel like they're standing at the base of a volcano that's about to erupt. The second thing we can do is offer full forgiveness. We need to tell the person that the reason why we are approaching them with this hurt is not to humiliate them. It's not to destroy the relationship. It's so that the sweetness of the relationship can be restored. And so you need to be clear about why you're doing this and the forgiveness that you want to offer. Now, the third thing we need to do is we need to find a way of absorbing our own wrath. And here's the catch. We need to do that in a way that doesn't expect the person who offended us to propitiate for themselves. We mustn't expect them to make it up to us before we would actually offer them forgiveness. Why? Because God didn't expect that of us. He knew we couldn't. And so he paid the price himself. And so when... We swallow our own wrath, so to speak. We're saying, I'll take the hit so that you won't have to. I won't hit back. I'm not going to demand an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I'm not going to destroy this relationship. I'm going to take the hit in such a way that it didn't even feel like you hit me in the first place. And that costs something. Timothy Keller 
described it like this in his uh, latest book on forgiveness. He said, forgiveness is a form of voluntary suffering. In forgiving rather than retaliating, you make a choice to bear the cost so that they wouldn't have to. And friends, I know that what I'm saying to you is hard. In some cases, it feels impossible for you. But then more than ever, you need to think about how God has loved you. You need to take some time out to sit at the foot of the cross to see how God took the cost. He took the hit so that you wouldn't have to. And he did that to restore the sweetness of his relationship with you. God has loved us like that. We should love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this uh, amazing scripture, which is very challenging to us and in many ways very humbling. It reminds us that you, Father, took the initiative to love because you are love. It reminds us of the gift of your Son who took the penalty for our sin. And it reminds us of what that should do to our hearts and what that should do to our community as a local church. Oh, Father, I pray that uh, this love would be tangible here in Beacon Church. I pray that we would be so melted and so humbled by the gospel that it just flows out of our hearts, on our tongues, flows into our hands and our feet. May it be in our veins. May it be the, the beat of our hearts here. And we pray this in Jesus' wonderful name.